Philippians 3.10 That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My title tonight comes from verse 11. The Apostle Paul said, If by any means. By any means. This past Sunday was Graduate Sunday, and I preached the message, Acceptable Losses. The Apostle Paul said, The things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung or rubbish, street garbage. One commentator I read this week said that I may win Christ. I want to review just a few points from Sunday really one-liners that I shared in the context of my message. Choose what you want from the shelf of life and pay for it. You can be almost anything, but you cannot be everything. Stop making excuses and start making decisions. You are no fool to sell what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. It is up to you to count the cost. And it is important how you call, count what is lost. We must consider what is lost to win Jesus Christ as garbage. If you inflate the value of what is lost, you will deflate the value of what is gained, that pearl of great price, Jesus Christ and eternal life. I hope you'll always remember the story of the wheat farmer that you will make sure that you save the main crop, your soul, and your family. Whatever you give up to get Jesus Christ is an acceptable loss. And as I was winding down my study for Sunday, I felt drawn back to Philippians 3, one great passage in the New Testament. And I felt that I should go through, I was reading through Philippians 3, pondering the message, and I was drawn to the words of verse 11 when the Apostle Paul said, by any means, by any means. I want to read through this section to give you a little context tonight. I don't need to fill up any time for sure. But Philippians 3, 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When you read these words, you can see that Paul was intentional about salvation. He was not haphazard about his eternal destiny. Certainly our faith has emotion, but it also has rationale. It has determination. It has the grace of God, the God that 
If He is for you, no one can be against you. But it also takes our determination and our intentionality. If you are saved, if I am saved, it will be because I am intentional about salvation. You will not be saved by accident. Your initial salvation was not just because you stumbled upon salvation. And as you're saved day by day, it is not accidental. It is intentional that you pray and take time to walk with God. That you're in your Bible and you discipline yourself through fasting. Ultimate salvation, when you breathe your last breath or when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes for His church, that salvation will not be accidental. It will be intentional. Salvation is not by election where God chooses your eternal destiny. Jesus certainly died for your sins and mine, but you must die to your sins to be saved. Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Recently on June 7, 2020, when I was ministering in the second service, the 1130 a.m. service. I misspoke when I was talking about this and I said, if it was up to the Lord, no one would be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches and certainly not what I intended. One of the job hazards of being a preacher is kind of misspeaking. What I meant to say is that if it was up to God, no one would be lost. I'm glad my friends were listening and kind of let me know that so I could correct that at the appropriate time. The Apostle Peter said that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Jesus did His part in dying for our sins. But we must do our part to turn from our sins and do Jesus Christ as our Savior. I want to give you several scriptural uh, paraphrases tonight just to let you know how much your effort is essential to your salvation. Jeremiah 29, 13, the Lord said, You will search for me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Jesus said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The Apostle Paul told the Athenian pagans that he is not far from any one of us if you will feel after him and find him but feeling after God requires effort. Jesus spoke of our effort in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter you in at the straight gate. Straight means skinny. In the Greek it is stenosis, like a narrowing of an artery in your body. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. I want you to notice these words of Jesus. That it doesn't take a lot of intentionality to be lost. All you have to do is go with the flow. You don't have to think. You don't have to weigh out. You don't have to go against the grain of culture. All you have to do is kind of get in the flow of our world. It's a wide gate. It's a broad way. And many people will be lost because they did not seek the way of salvation. And Jesus said this is the reason not everyone is saved. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life and few there be that find it. In the context of all these scriptures that I've shared with you briefly, there has to be on our part, on your part, a desire to go to heaven a desire to find that pearl of great price and to find that treasure that is hidden in the field. You can be lost without trying, but you must decide that you're going to be saved. Only Jesus can save you, but paradoxically, only you can choose to save yourself. From a few weeks ago, many other words of Pentecost on June 7, Acts 2 and 40 And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, Save yourselves from this untoward, from this crooked generation. Paul's outlook and attitude was that he was going to be saved whatever it cost. He said in verse 11, 
by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Before Christ, Saul of Tarsus, the old Paul, was relentless and intentional about stamping out Christianity. You could surmise that by any means was his mantra before Christ. By any means throw Christians in jail. By any means compel them to blaspheme. Hunt them down wherever they are. Condemn them to die. He said, I gave my voice against them, implying that he was a member of the Sanhedrin and voted for their death. Witness their martyrdom. Hold the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And by any means, whatever it takes, make sure that you can stamp out Christianity. Paul's own words. For I thought myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I did it at Jerusalem. Saints of God, I shut up in prison. I had authority from the chief priests and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I punished them often in, in every synagogue and I compelled them to blaspheme. That phrase is always stuck in my mind that there must have been times when under the threat of imprisonment or death that Christian people denied the name of Jesus Christ as Saul of Tarsus and the soldiers that were with them threatened them and they denied the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I was exceedingly mad against them and I persecuted them even to strange cities referring to outside of Judea. When he went to Damascus, he had authority and he was commissioned by the chief priest. And that is when in Acts 26 that I'm reading from, Paul was arrested by Jesus Christ. It happened in Acts 9 and Paul is retelling his testimony. After salvation, Paul's passion for salvation, to know Jesus Christ and to preach and teach the gospel surpassed his previous passion to stamp out Christianity. Paul knew that he was a miracle of grace. He considered himself to be the chiefest of sinners. He said that he was less than the least of all the saints. He said, I was like one that was born out of due time. Paul said, I am the least of the apostles. He didn't feel that he was worthy to be an apostle because he persecuted the church of God. But then Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, even though I had all that, the grace of God was on me and I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul was relentless and intentional in his pursuit of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was determined to be saved by any means. I want you to look at some of the statements that Paul makes about his intent to be saved. I'll read them and then we'll go through these verses in just a few moments. Paul said, to be found in him, that I may know him. He said, if by any means. He said, I follow after describing his pursuit. He said that I may apprehend or take hold on Jesus Christ. He said this one thing I do. He said I forget the past. He said I reach for the future. He said I press for the prize. Each of these phrases could be developed into a message, an entire message on their own. But let's walk through our text tonight in Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. I want to just highlight what was going on in Paul's heart and mind about being saved, whatever it took, that he made up his mind by any means that he would make sure that he was right with God and that he was saved for eternity. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. To be found in him, those words that Paul gave us, means that Paul said, after examination, when I stand before God in the judgment, and he looks deep into my soul, that I would be found in him as righteous. 
both now in his life and at the end of his life. His passion was that Jesus Christ would see him as righteous. But Paul said that I would be found in Christ, not in his own righteousness that was of the Old Testament law. Not by anything that he did as a Pharisee when he said as touching the law, I was blameless. Paul understood that if any man, he wrote this, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No matter how proud Paul had been of his blameless life, according to the Old Testament law, that was all in the past. He would write that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. He would write that our righteousness was imputed. It was put on our account. It was as if our bank account spiritually was in the red. We were morally bankrupt. But when we came to Jesus Christ, repenting of our sins, being baptized in Jesus' name, being filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, that God Almighty went to our spiritual bank account. He imputed His righteousness there. He made a deposit of His righteousness on our account, and we are found in Him blameless by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is not our righteousness, but it is imputed righteousness, the righteousness of God. And Paul said, I want to be found in Him blameless, not having mine own righteousness that is of the law, but the righteousness that is of God by faith in Jesus Christ. He was talking about his standing before God, if by any means he wanted to be blameless when he stood in the judgment before God. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. On the road to Damascus when Paul was arrested by Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 9, Paul asked two questions of the Lord. Who are you and what do you want me to do? But when he asked, who are you, Lord? He spent his lifetime not just knowing the identity of Jesus Christ, but knowing Jesus Christ. I would think of him much like Moses of the Old Testament, that there is not a prophet in the, in the history of mankind who like Moses knew God face to face, who talked to God face to face as a man talks to his friend. Paul would speak about an encounter with God, whether in the body or out of the body, he could not tell. He had a walk with God that was probably somewhat unsurpassed, and I'm not trying to judge him. He was not Jesus Christ. I'm I'm not making him like that. But Paul spent his life passionately living out this quest that I may know him. And in this verse he says, first, in the power of of His resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ brought power over sin, over death, and over Satan. Jesus said that He had the keys of death and hell. And we follow that pattern of death, burial, and resurrection initially in salvation when we find a brand new life. We rise, as Romans 6 says, we rise to walk in the newness of life. You cannot... No, Jesus Christ, though, in the power of His resurrection until you first know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. Jesus did not have resurrection power until He first had the power that came from the suffering of the cross. And for us, knowing Jesus Christ in the fellowship of His suffering. That's why when the Apostle Paul was giving us instruction about communion, the Lord's Supper, that as often as you do this, you remember the Lord's death, you honor the Lord's death, you do show forth, he says, the Lord's death till He comes again. And when we repent of our sins, we identify with the fellowship of His sufferings. When we practice the cost of discipleship, which is self-denial, we fellowship the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And as I've said numerous times, even this past Sunday, I believe in passing, not a part of my message, but the cross is the test of complete obedience to the will of God. 
for Jesus Christ when he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He did not want to become sin. He was blameless, righteous, sinless. But to drink that cup meant becoming sin for the sins of the world, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So when we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him to the place of complete obedience, of submission, we fellowship the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want to know Him in the power of His resurrection and in the fellowship of His suffering. I want to be made conformable unto the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Christ could be manifest to me, he would say in another place. So when we receive communion, we remember the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. We embrace, so to speak, the death of Jesus Christ, denying ourselves, being made conformable unto his death. When we mortify or put to death sinful acts in our life, when we die to temptation, we are made conformable to the death of Jesus Christ. The power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings go hand in hand. And then our key verse tonight, verse 11 of Philippians 3, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now we know that the first means to us attaining unto the resurrection of Jesus is to a resurrection of the dead is by Embracing the death of Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, repentance, baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But Paul says beyond initial salvation, I want to be in that resurrection. I want to rise from the dead. I want to live forever. And no matter what it takes, by any means, I want to attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul is very clear in saying, that whatever it takes, he's made up his mind that he's going to be saved whatever it takes. Nothing else really matters to Paul. Whatever he has to give up to gain Jesus Christ, it is rubbish to him. It doesn't matter at all in his life. It is indeed an acceptable loss. And when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you have resurrection power in your life. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of the resurrected Christ that dwells in us. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you can say it both ways that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And if He is in us and we are in Him at the resurrection of the dead, we can say that by any means I have attained into the only thing that really matters in life is that I attain unto the resurrection of the dead and that I am saved by any means. That means that no price is too great. That no loss is too severe. That nothing is worth losing my soul over. No offense that I would never let go without forgiving the offender. No temptation so great that I would not choose to serve God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. No persecution, even martyrdom. Paul said it does not matter what comes into my life, whether it is a struggle or a temptation or persecution or his ultimate martyrdom, by any means, he said, I want to attain under the resurrection of the dead. But then now Paul begins to give us a little insight into some of his efforts to make sure that by any means he would be saved. What are those means? He said, I will follow after, I will forget the past, and I will reach forward to the future promises of God, and I will press toward the mark for the high prize of God, the call, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12 of Philippians 3. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. 
And Paul says, I'm following after. Following after what? Following after Jesus Christ, his example, his suffering, as the apostle Peter would said that he left us an example that we would follow in his steps. Paul said, I am striving to become the man that Jesus saw I could be when he saved me. If Paul could say that he had not attained, that he was not perfect, that he was still trying to get there, that he was trying to apprehend or lay hold on that for which Christ had laid hold on him, then we should never feel ashamed or embarrassed when we know or we feel like we're not good enough, that we've not attained, that we all have a long way to go. On the flip side, I guess I should say that if you think you've arrived, that you've attained, that you're perfect, maybe you should go back and read Philippians 3 again. Now Paul was fond of using sports illustrations in his writing. And he was moving toward the picture of a race where a wreath would be placed on the head of the person who won that race. As far as my studies have shown, there was not gold, silver, bronze. It was just a wreath on the winner. It was winner take all. Paul said that they all complete, but only one receives the prize. But each of us are in our own race. We are in our own competition against our best, against ourselves, not with anyone else. Paul uses this play on words that's really awkwardly, but to me beautifully phrased in the King James. That I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The New King James says that I could lay hold on that. Think about that prize, a crossing the finish line. So Paul is saying here that when Jesus found me on the road to Damascus, he apprehended me, he arrested me. And when he did, he saw the Paul that I could become. He saw a grown-up Paul, a Paul that would be perfected, made perfect through sufferings. And Paul said, I am following after. If by any means I can become that man that Jesus knew I could be when he saved me. And I will tell you that I am motivated by the hope that I, Daryl Johns, could one day become the man that Jesus Christ had in mind when he saved me. So I want to follow after. I want to apprehend. I want to become the best that I can be so that by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. For Paul, that was the goal. And for each of us, it should also be our goal that by any means we might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. When Jesus Christ took hold of Paul on the road to Damascus, there was a plan, there was a picture, there was a prophecy about the future of Paul's ministry that he would spend his life in pursuit of that perfected man was the passion of Paul. He was both relentless and intentional. Then in verse 13, Paul is saying by any means, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I've not arrived. But this one thing I do. Now we're not going to really know the one thing until the next verse, but he's going to tell us how he's able to focus on this one thing. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press. That's what we'll get into the next verse. Now on Sunday when I was teaching, preaching on acceptable losses, I said that Paul made the statement, this one thing I do, not these 50 things I dabble in. I want you to think about being intentional, about being focused about being determined. Several years ago, I was ministering in Arkansas and they gave me a book called One Word. And the idea of the book is not that there's just one word for everybody, but there may be one word in your life at this time that summarizes what you should be thinking and doing. And I remember as I scanned through that book, I felt like to me, the word should be relentless, that I should not slack up that I should, be my, I should be relentless in pursuit of God's will and God's best in my life. 
and I desire to remain relentless until my last breath or until the trumpet sounds. But as I mentioned earlier in this message, as much as Paul was relentless, he was also intentional. In 1 Corinthians 9, he, he talks about running in a race, running to receive the prize. He said he does it to obtain an incorruptible crown. And he said, I don't run uncertainly. I'm not just out for a little jog. And he talked about fighting. He said, I'm not like a shadow boxer, one that just is beating the air. He wants to make every punch land and count. He wants to make every stride move toward the goal of eternal life. He is intentional about the prize that God has held up before him. And in order to do that, Paul said, I've got to let go of the past. I've got to forget those things which are behind. They may have been sins. It may have been persecution against the church that haunted him when he saw those people put to death, even Stephen, when he saw them blaspheme or deny Jesus Christ, when he saw them go to jail. Certainly that was in Paul's mind and he had to let go of that. And then there was his past notoriety as a Pharisee, as an elite person, as a theologian. And Paul had to let go of the successes of his past. So regardless of what your past held for you and how it shaped you, Paul said, if I'm going to be saved by any means, I've got to let go of everything in the past that would slow me down and hinder me. And then he said, I have to reach forth unto those things that are before. I'm letting go of the past so it doesn't drag me down and slow me down. And I'm reaching forth to those things which are before. The prize, he said. Now Paul is writing from prison. He's not thinking about another missionary journey or writing another epistle, but I'm sure he wrote more after this time. He saw far past the goals of this life. He saw the prize of eternal life. So forgetting the past, and reaching forth for the future, Paul would say in Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. These words are so powerful. I press. I'm pressing toward a mark, toward the finish line. I'm pressing for a prize that is there, a crown of life, he said that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love His appearing. Not a trophy, but the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize of eternal life. That's why my text tonight and my title is, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You see, the price for Paul and for us may be high, but it is a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul anticipated the day when he would victoriously cross the finish line and that the Lord, the righteous judge, would crown him for finishing his race, for obtaining eternal life. And Paul strove toward that goal no matter what he had to give up. By any means, he made up his mind that he would be saved. So let me ask you tonight. Do you have a passion so strong for something that you could say, I want to achieve that, whatever that is, by any means? And in desiring that, could you say that my desire, my greatest desire, and the passion of my life is that by any means, regardless of what I have to let go of, regardless of what I have to give up, by any means I want to attain under the resurrection of the dead. What are you willing to discard from your life to obtain that goal, that dream of eternal life? How do you feel about the place that Jesus Christ holds in your life? Is He your priority? Is He your chief passion? Is being saved the most important thing for you? And are you determined to attain into the resurrection of the dead by any means, are you pursuing the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Are you forgetting the past, successes and failures? Are you reaching forward to a spiritually successful future? Are you following after Jesus Christ? My message to you tonight 
is that by any means make up your mind that you're going to heaven and you're going to be the very best you can be for Jesus Christ. And whatever you lose to give that to, to have him, whatever you have to give up, it is an acceptable loss that you could be saved by any means. I'd like for us to pray right now and then we're going to play some music so you can pray in the privacy of your home or wherever you're watching right now. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the example that you set for us, that for the joy that was set before you, that you endured the cross, you despised the shame so that you could sit down in the throne of Almighty God, for you are God alone. And Lord, there are many witnesses in the grandstands of heaven that are watching us run our race. And certainly, Lord, Paul would be one of them, not an Old Testament witness, but a New Testament witness. He's watching God along with that heavenly crowd. Their lives are witness to the race that we ourselves are in. I ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, to help me make up my mind that whatever I have to do by any means that I would be saved, that I would attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I pray right now, Lord, for your people who might be struggling with very issues in their life. It might be worldliness. It might be a weight or a sin. It could be a fence that they're carrying in their life, Lord, where someone has hurt them and they're struggling to forgive them. Lord, whatever it takes, help us be saved by any means. And I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. And I give you glory for the example you set and for the word you gave. In Jesus' name, amen.